Welcome back to another episode of Stubborn Love. I'm your host, Paige Bond, and today we have a very, very special guest. Um, not only because we share the last name, um, <laughs> but because she is a very special person uh, that I met recently who I actually got to chat with and guest on her own podcast. So her name is LaToya Bond, and she's a podcast host of Speaking of Love podcast and also a suicide prevention advocate. And so today she is here to share her story, um, to help others, to inform others. Uh, and I'm just really excited about to have this chat with you, LaToya. So so glad to have you here today. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about who you are? And we'll kind of dive into some other topics around the topic of suicide today. Wow. Well, thank you, Paige Bond, from one Miss Bond to another. Thank you so much for having me here on your podcast. I really appreciate it. My name is LaToya, and I am the host of Speaking of Love podcast. My podcast was created in honor of my dad, who took his own life in a murder-suicide. My father was a wonderful person. He was a radio TV broadcast engineer for a major television network uh, for many years. He made positive contributions to society. And one of the great things he did was he hosted a radio show many years ago called Speaking of Sports. So when he when he passed away, I wanted to do something to honor him. And I knew he loved being a radio host. So I thought, I'll start a podcast in his honor, but I know nothing about sports. So my show is called Speaking of Love instead of Speaking of Sports. And I just interview people from all around the world, different walks of life. And we talk on the subject of love. Um, people come to me for advice. Uh, and then I always include a little something about suicide prevention and awareness, because since the passing of my dad, I have really uh, dedicated my life to learning more about the subject of suicide. And um, aside from that, I am a legal professional. And then I also run a, a small home-based business. So I keep myself busy these days. Mm, you sure do keep yourself busy wearing so many hats. And I, I know how busy you, you are just with running your podcast and YouTube channel and being able to connect with people and spreading this awareness for suicide prevention. And I think what you're doing is so lovely to be able to honor your father in, in such a beautiful way and, and in a way where you're, you're basically drawing that same parallel where he was running his own show with sports and you're getting to do that in such a beautiful way to honor him mm. well thank you thank you for saying that yeah so I um am really excited to talk about this topic today because I think suicide awareness is sort of a, a hush hush thing and not something that we all talk about um and can really be seen as kind of something that we are ashamed of, you know, even having passive suicidal ideation. And so it's really hard to reach out and to connect to others, which can make us feel a lot more alone and really spiral into a deep, dark place. So um, as far as suicide prevention and advocacy, could you tell listeners what even that looks like? Like, how do you advocate and what is advocating for suicide prevention? Well, thank you for that, Paige. Uh, when my father passed away, I knew immediately that I wanted to learn more about the subject of suicide. I knew what suicide was, but I didn't know the statistics behind it and the science behind the human brain and, and the mind and what makes a person go to that dark place. So what I have learned, I'm going to share with you all, your audience today. First, I'd like to let you all know that 47,000 people died by suicide last year in the United States alone. Every 11 minutes, someone dies by suicide. So that means, Paige, by the time we get done airing this podcast right now, we will have lost at least three people. 90% of the people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental illness. And if you're standing in a room with 100 people 
at least two of those people are contemplating suicide at that moment. It's a very serious topic and my role and my position and my mission is to erase the stigma because there's a lot of negative thoughts about suicide and people go quiet and they don't want to discuss it. But suicide has become more prevalent now, especially after the pandemic than ever before. And a lot of people believe that the suicide rates are higher around the holidays, but that's not true. Depression starts to set in around the holidays, but the numbers really go higher for suicide in the spring. So we're, we're facing that time now where the numbers are going to start growing. And I just want to educate you all about the topic of suicide because it's, it's real. Wow. And to, to hear those numbers, that is staggering. When, when I hear you say, if you're standing in a room of 100 people, 2% of the whole room is thinking about suicide. And I, I don't think this is well-known information that people think of daily, that mm-hmm. people know how um, how many people are struggling with the actual thoughts of wanting to end their life. Yes. Um, you're far more likely to encounter someone having suicidal thoughts than you are to encounter someone having a heart attack. And you know how common heart attacks are. So just wow. to give you a reference. Yeah. 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 And when I hear you say that even just in the time of us ending uh, this podcast, how many deaths will happen by suicide. And these are only, if I'm correct, you said the statistics, these are only in the United States or that's worldwide? Well, this is only in the United States. According to the CDC, 47,000 people died by suicide last year alone in the United States. That doesn't even include other countries, you know, Canada and places like that. Mm, mm. And we we are only a small portion of the world here in the U.S. So this is a worldwide issue, mm-hmm. not just, you know, known in the U.S. But even, even with that, those numbers are massive. Mm-hmm. And there's probably more. The numbers may be higher, just depending on the way that the death was reported to the county in which the person lived. So we ex- we suspect that the numbers may be even higher. Wow. Wow. Um, is there any reason why some deaths that are, are likely actually suicides but are reported otherwise? Like, is there any reasoning behind that? Do you know? Uh, well, you know, because of medical reasons, like the autopsy may not reveal uh, exactly the manner, like if the person takes a, a drug that isn't easy to be detected, it could be a number of factors. So those, if a person passes away and it's undecided how they died, then that wouldn't be in the category of suicide when it may, it is, you know, very well have been. So, yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And um so kind of getting back to this idea that we're we're all walking around with quite a bit of people who are struggling with thoughts of ending their life. Um, you know, as as someone who is just a, you know, person who isn't involved in a situation, who doesn't know, who doesn't have the information, um, I'm wondering what us regular people could do to be able to help those who are struggling, even if we may not know that they're struggling with anything like that? Well, some people exhibit behaviors that are indicative of someone who is contemplating suicide, and then some people don't. And you, a lot of us, we just don't know what the signs are. For example, my dad didn't really show signs of depression, uh, things of that nature. But what he did do was he always joked about suicide. So for example, I would call him at the end of a long day and I call and I say, hey, dad, how are you? How was your day today? And he'd go, oh, I'm tired. I'm just looking for the bridge. And I would go, why? Why are you looking for th- what bridge? And he'll say, I'm ready to jump. I'm ready to jump. You know, we would laugh about it. And it was like a standing joke. And now I realize with suicide, hindsight is twenty twenty. There was a level of truth to his joke, to his sarcasm. And he he really wanted to end his, his pain. 
And what I know about suicide is that people who take their own lives don't necessarily want to die. They just want their pain to end. So if I could give you um, a little background about suicide, the warning signs, okay? So I'm going to read from my list here because it seems like when I try to do this without my list, I always think later on like, oh my God, I forgot one. So I'm going to give you uh, what I what I have here. And all this information is from the CDC, okay? So um, people who have a family history of suicide, like myself, I lost my dad to suicide. So I am at a greater risk of committing suicide myself because of the desire for a reunion, wanting to be with my dad, longing to to fix what was broken and to heal um, the regrets that I have. So I have to be very careful how I lead my life as a suicide loss survivor. Uh, Other factors include difficult life events, such as experiencing uh, the loss of a child, uh, emotional abuse, a person who has been physically abused, people who have stressful events in their lives, like losing a loved one, losing a relationship, going through a divorce, having a miscarriage, uh, feeling isolated, feeling as if you have no family support, excessive drug use, living with a mental condition, caring for someone, being a caregiver is a is another fa- risk factor for suicide. And people who have problems with work or finances, they're at a greater risk for suicide. So some of the warning signs, like I said, are isolation, talking about committing suicide, uh, giving away prized possessions. I, I spoke with a lady the other day and her husband took his own life and he gave away his class ring. He graduated from a prestigious college maybe about 30 years ago and he just gave away his ring. And a couple weeks later, he took his own life. Um, people who lack the desire to groom themselves, uh, not going to work, losing an interest in things that you normally find them uh, enjoying. All of those can be risk factors and warning signs for suicide. Yeah. So I'm I'm hearing like towards the end of what you were saying, um, there's a lot of overlap with, in, in my clinical work, major depression, um, diagnosable depression by a mental health professional doctor. Um, what have you. One thing that stood out to me as kind of a surprise um, as a risk factor is you said that that caring for someone is, puts you at a risk factor for suicide, like, a, like yes. caregiving. Sure. So let's say you have a relative who has a, a terminal disease and you're taking care of this individual and you're devoting your time to caring for, to, for someone who's sick. And then when that individual passes away, you yourself could become mentally challenged and depression, anxiety sets in, you start to feel guilty, you know, like, oh my goodness, I failed them, they passed away. So it all leads back to the depression. Like I said earlier, 90% of the people who commit suicide have had a mental health diagnosis. So we just have to take better care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and I want to get to maybe some tips we can talk about uh, about how to take care of ourselves. But um, right now, I kind of want to stick on like these these signs. When, when people um, are noticing these signs, maybe they're noticing people aren't, you know, taking showers and having proper hygiene. They're missing days at work. Maybe a coworker is noticing this or a friend or a loved one. What would you recommend or advise that they do in this situation for the person that they see this changed behavior in? Okay, so what what I would recommend for them to do is confront them, confront the situation, but go to them with love. Don't go with judgment. Don't go with criticism. Lower your voice when you're speaking to them. So I would go and say, hi, Lisa, how are you today? You know, I noticed that you haven't been yourself lately what's going on? And I would listen to the person. Don't try to fix what's wrong. Just be an open, soft place for them to land and just listen to them. And once they describe what they're going through, I want you to ask them directly. Don't beat around the bush. Say to them, wow, I understand how that could be hard. You know, people who have gone through what you're facing right now often think of suicide. Are you thinking of suicide? 
Are you thinking of taking your own life? Ask them directly. Studies show that asking them directly opens up the door for them to feel comfortable to talk to you about it. Because remember, they've isolated themselves. They don't feel that they can talk to anyone and even say, I don't want to live anymore. So with you asking them, that's going to help them open up more. So if they do reveal to you that they're contemplating suicide or they're having thoughts, the worst thing you can do is judge them. For example, this would be a horrible response. What? You're thinking about suicide? Oh, come on. That guy is not even worth it. Are you kidding me? You'll get another job. Don't worry about that. Oh, your son died? Oh, you, you can have another baby. You Come on. You can't be that weak. Are you kidding me? So don't, because people actually have, have made those comments. So when you when the person comes to you and they reveal that they're having those thoughts, Lower your voice, talk to them with empathy and compassion, and stay with them. Be focused on them. Put your cell phone down and look them in the eyes. Put your hand on their shoulder. Talk to them. Let them know that you care and just be there for them. And what I would advise you to do if the person is contemplating suicide, encourage them to dial 988 and you two can do it together because what's going to happen at that point a trained crisis worker is going to be on the line and they can walk you through the next steps with this individual i i love how you highlighted how important it is to just be a listener rather than a fixer and coming at this without judgment, because I, I can definitely hear the difference and, and the different ways you described of, okay, this is what you would do to be very supportive to help someone struggling with these thoughts. And here is where it could really turn wrong and help, you know, make the person feel judged and not want to open up anymore. Something that stood out to me as you were talking about that is, um, you said, don't beat around the bush and ask directly if they are thinking about suicide. And I think it's a common misconception with people that if they ask about suicide, then that's going to basically put it in their mind or give them the idea to kill themselves and that, you know, it would be their fault for thinking of that idea and verbalizing it and yada, yada, yada. So can you kind of talk about how there is that big misconception that talking about suicide kind of makes it more likely to happen? Well, yes, because there is a misconception that if you if you ask the person if they're contemplating taking their own lives, then you're going to push them further into doing it. Research shows that that's far from the truth. That's not going to happen. If anything, you're opening up a door for them to come to you and talk to you and have a safe place to land um, and with those thoughts. So don't be afraid to ask the questions. Don't say, are you thinking of harming yourself? Say, are you thinking of ending your own life? Are you thinking of suicide? Say the word, let them know, because then they'll have, they'll feel safer and they'll be able to talk to you about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I also think added into that, if you're the person bringing up the word suicide, they can get a sense and feel that you have this deep concern about them. Mm-hmm. It's not the, oh, are you are you just having a bad day? They understand that the person listening gets that this is a very serious possibility. And I, I think a lot of, well, I, I won't say that because I can't speak for people who have um, gone through that process of thinking about ending their life, but I wonder if it's a common thought that um, or feeling for people who are ending their lives to feel like they haven't been taken seriously on a number of things. And so this is a way that they finally feel like they're being taken seriously when they're being directly asked if they're ending their life. What do you think about that? I agree with you 100%. People, you see, when people are 
in the mode of, of thinking of ending their own lives, they're already isolated in their minds because suicide is a disease of the mind, not a disease of the brain. So the mind is telling them the suicidal thoughts, the depression, the anxiety is telling them, end your life. You're not worthy. No one cares about you. So if you come to them and you talk to them and you ask them directly, then that's going to kind of change the dynamic in their mind. Like, okay, well, this person is seeing me out. I'm a person. They can they they visualize me. They they can see that I I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm going through something. And another thing I want to bring forth too is if a person does reveal to you that they're contemplating taking their own lives, one thing you can say to them is, you know, I've been in some tough places in my life before where I didn't want to live anymore. Or just share a short story, not too long, but just a short story to kind of empathize with them. That way you can kind of walk in their shoes and say, wow, I've been there. I know what it feels yeah. like. Yeah, I love that idea because that can probably relieve some of the feeling that they've been having, that they feel so alone. And by sharing, you know, as the listener, sharing your own struggle with them, that can just help them feel less alone in that. I love that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing you want them to be is alone because the isolation is the biggest factor for suicide and people feel alone and just letting them know that you are not alone. I'm sure you've seen the, the billboards, you are not alone. And that's the one thing they need to know is that somebody somewhere cares. Yeah. Oh. When... um. You know, you get to that point, you know, if you're talking to someone and they are thinking about ending their life, you call the 988 number, you're speaking to this crisis counselor. Um, as as the person who is the caring, um, you know, uh, just bystander trying to help, what what is the responsibility of that person to be able to care for or make sure that that the person who's struggling with thoughts of ending their life, what is the responsibility of this listener, bystander? Well, here's the thing, you, you know, I, I'm not a lifesaver. I'm just here to help you save your life, but I have to have your willingness, your participation. And, you know, we all have a journey that we're going to, that we take in life. And some people I'm going to be able to help and some people I'm not going to be able to help. So you have to know that going in as an advocate that you're not going to be able to save everyone because not everyone wants to be saved. You can't you, you it's it's unfortunate, but not all people can be reached and saved. So as long as I have your participation, your willingness, my role is to take you by the hand and lead you to a trained professional who can help you and who can maybe if you need a 72 hour hold in the hospital for a mental health assessment, my role is to get you. I am a liaison. I am I am going to help you get to the next level of care. I that, yeah, I think that's so important. What you're highlighting is that, you know, as the bystander, you are not trained uh, unless you are, you know, a mental health crisis counselor or a doctor of sorts who has mental health training. You don't have the skills or ability to know necessarily what to do next, nor is it really your role to do that in that capacity, you know, as just this caring, compassionate person. And I think that can often get, um, mixed up a lot you know we kind of take on this role of hero or um just savior and take on all of this responsibility and it can also turn into this you must do this because i want you to live rather than really listening to the person struggling and hearing out their story i'm wondering if you kind of hear that often in your work Yes. Yeah, see, when it comes to suicide prevention, if a person is, is wanting to go and take their own lives, any person can save a life. You don't necessarily have to be a trained professional. You don't have to have a degree in, in medicine to save a life. But what I will say is not every person is able to be saved. I mean, sometimes the mental illness is, is so uh, prevalent and just, you know, we all have our own journey. And unfortunately, some people are going to die by suicide. But all you can do is get the person to the next level of care. 
in whatever capacity that is. And that's your role. If they're willing, if they're not willing, then maybe you have to dial 911 on your own. If they're not willing to go with you to call 988 for help, then maybe you need to make the call because I would rather for you make to make the call and be wrong than to make the call and live with the regret that you could have helped them, but you didn't. So, and if someone tells you that they want to take their own life and they have a plan and they're going to execute it, don't be afraid to dial 911. Get help for them because that, that person is at the edge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you mentioned something a little bit about a 72-hour hold. And um, th- that's something, you know, that every state's a little bit different on the legality. Sometimes it's voluntarily held. Sometimes this is a mandatory um, way to be able to keep this person safe from being um, harmful to themselves. Um, when I- I've spoken to people who actually have been in inside the hospitals and had that 72-hour hold. And I've noticed that some of them come back and say, well, I've had a bad experience, so I don't want to talk about um, whenever I do have suicidal thoughts because I'm afraid I'm going to get put back in and I'm going to have another bad experience that was traumatizing. What... Um, eh, what can we either like respond to with people who have had bad experiences like that? Well, here's the thing, Paige. Um, research shows that when people have a suicide attempt and they're placed in the hospital for, you know, 72 hour hold, they're given, you know, med- med- psychotropic medications and they're getting the help that they need. Do you know that those people if they're going to end their lives, it will happen within 90 days of being released from that, from the hospital setting. So those three months after a hospital stay like that are the most critical. And those individuals need to be cared for. They need to be monitored. And you just kind of have to stay in communication with them because you might look at them and say, oh, he's doing better. Everything's fine. But eh, studies show that the suicidal rates are higher during that, it's very critical that 90 days after the hospital release. Wow. I actually had no idea about um, that 90-day critical period. So I'm, I'm hearing it's just really important to check in more, continue to be direct, continue to listen and be empathic, especially more so during that 90-day period after being released from that hold. Yeah, yeah. Stay in communication with them. And another thing, Paige, I want your listeners to know that if you have a medical mental health diagnosis and your doctor gives you medication to help you with your 